See, I feel like when the Lord empowers me to preach like this, the whole thing is an altar call. Like the whole time you're at the altar. Come on, that's right. Like you don't just have to come up here. See, an altar call is not. <gasps> an altar call is like, duh. Yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> that's an altar call. Because it's not just boo hoo. And we think God's really moving. People are crying hard. I've seen altar calls where people are crying so hard. I've asked people over the years, why are you crying so hard? They were condemned at the altar. They felt like they couldn't change. They were like, God, if you don't change me, I'm just going to go back to the same thing. Woo! And the preachers are saying, look how hard they're crying. God's really moving. I'm thinking, no, they're believing the wrong thing, some of them. I already asked about three of them. <laughs> See, repentance is a change. It's a turn of mind. It's a turn from and a turn to. It could look like this. Duh, yeah! Repentance, what, whoa, oh yeah, wow, wow. Who's ever had those moments where you're seeing something a certain way and all of a sudden God goes, and you go, oh yeah, repentance. We always think repentance is some emotional outburst. It's a turning. Hmm. Seven fifty-eight. We started at six. For a guy like me, I always thought that was an extra hour, but it's not. But I always thought it was. A pastor ruined that for me for about four years ago. I was like, he said, "Now look, tomorrow we're starting at six, so we can get out. You know, maybe a little earlier because we're coming back for Sunday." And I went, "Is that why everybody does six when I come in town to get out an hour earlier?" I've been blowing that the whole time. Like the whole time. I'm thinking, I've never got that right. Like I always thought in my mind, oh, they're so sweet, they flew me in, and, and now I'm getting an extra hour. <laughs> and then the pastor said that, so now my conscience is violated. <laughs> so then every time they say six, I'm thinking, bummer. I used to think extra hour. So then I say to the pastor, now he already told me, now tomorrow we're starting at six because we got three services Sunday, and maybe it won't be as late. So he, see, he messed me up. <laughs> no, he didn't. Because I would ask him. I would have said, now, are you starting at 6, like, just because open service? <laughs> or so it might not get so late because we all got to come back and you got leaders and people and committed in three services. I would have asked him. Because my conscience is bothered now. I can't just take the hour and run with it. I mean, I've really blown. Some of my 6 o'clock services have been my longest services. <laughs> Like, leave at 10.30, like, I'm up in northern PA, it was 10.45, I was still preaching and didn't even breathe. People were sitting there, I told two stories, it was dramatic, and everybody's just, it was one of the moments, you'd have had to been there. I preached three hours and six minutes and never blinked. It's hard to comprehend, three hours and six minutes and never even blinked, and people weren't distracted, they were just sitting there. And a seven-year-old stood up, I said, oh my goodness. I, there was a, above the sound booth, there was this big full moon clock like you see in schools and stuff. And I said, there ain't no way that was there all night. I'd have seen it. It was huge. It looked like a full moon. And all of a sudden, I went, whoa. And I saw the time. And I thought the sound person had taken it down in the beginning because I had mentioned something about time. And then I thought they thought, you know what? This isn't really funny anymore. And they put it up. That's what I thought happened. I'm being honest. And I went, oh my goodness, is that the time? And everybody was like, time, what time? And then you could hear the rumble. Whoa. Because nobody was looking. Nobody, everybody was just like this. A seven-year-old girl right where you're sitting, she just jumped to her feet. I said, oh my goodness, I got to stop. She looked distressed. Seven. I asked her how old she was. She jumped to her feet and said, no. I said, no. I said, honey, I've been preaching for hours. A guy over here, right where you're sitting with a cell phone, he said, three hours and six minutes, I'm recording. <laughs> I said, I've been preaching three hours and six minutes. How old are you? She said, seven. I said, you're seven years old. I've been preaching three hours and six minutes. You should be like tapping your mom saying, mom, is this guy ever going to shut up? I want to go home. 
She said, oh no, sir. I get so much out of what you say. <laughs> Seven! <laughs> and then I said, you know what, guys? I'm going to keep preaching. And she did some kind of something. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but she started doing something. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm just kidding, honey. And she went. <laughs> Next morning, she came running to me. She said, hi. I said, hi, beautiful. Come here. That was so precious. You touched my heart. Like she said, well, they all call me the prayer warrior of the church. <laughs> What seven-year-old says this? She honored her children's church. What seven-year-old says this? Most seven-year-olds would be like, you know, I want to stay up here and listen to you. I don't want to go to church, down church, kids' church. She said, you know, nothing against my children's church. I love my children's church, and I love my teacher. But I don't want to go down there today. I wanted to stay up here. She wanted to stay up. And I said, well, let me tell you what you do. Where's your parents? She said, one of her daddy's working sound. And I said, listen, here's what you do. Now, the parents didn't know I did this, but they'd have appreciated it if they knew, because I'm always pastoring. I said, now, here's what you do, honey. You go ask your parents from your heart sincerely, if you could stay up, that you'd love to hear the message today, even though you love your children's church, and they, if it would be okay with them. Now, here's what you've got to understand. Whenever you put your parents in a position to say yes or no, you have to understand you put them in that position, and you have to accept and honor their answer. And that's what it means to honor your mother and father. Because if you go, oh, but I want, but no, but I want. I said, then there's no honor. I said, so if you put them in that position and they say, well, no, honey, you know, I think it'd be best if you just go down with your class. You just say, okay, thank you. And go do your class. And that's before the Lord. And she went. She took off running. I'm in the middle of preaching Sunday morning, my magnificent sermon. I'm preaching. And I look, and she said, yeah. <laughs> you know, her mom got healed that night of 10 or 13, or there's so many things that happened over the years, but no, it was 15 years. That's why I'm listening. I'm just, I know this is true. It was 15 years of an auto accident that impaired her body. And even though it was a quarter of 11, Jesus wasn't slumbering. <laughs> and she got healed, and she laid in the front for a half hour and just sobbed and cried because her body was doing what it hadn't done for 15 years. In a moment. Isn't that fun? So listen, I'm not having an order call for what I preach tonight. I'm calling you to go after this thing with all your heart. Listen, you, you live with you. You know you. You know your want-tos. You know your not-want-tos. Here's what I've done a lot. Look, I've made this simple. Like a long time ago, I said, Lord, if I'm going to be preaching in front of people, and people like you are going to ask me to come to your church, I said, then you got to please do something for me. Like, when I'm done preaching, let a man only have two options. You say, two? Yeah, because he has a will. He has a free will. Let a man only have two options. Let a man say, you know what? I hear what he's saying, and I want it. Or, you know, I hear what he's saying. I just don't want it. But I said, please, when I'm done, don't let nobody say, what's he saying? <laughs> and I don't think tonight you're saying, what's he saying? I this, saying I want it. Amen. <laughs> this kind of message is the love of God because it gives you a crystal clear option and locates your heart. Amen. Guys, that's why there's a judgment. People choose to believe or not believe. You say, well, I believe. I'm just not. That's the same as not believing. In the end of time, the life you live will reveal what you really believed. And the just shall live by bam. So in those eight years with my wife, rather than get hurt and talk myself into some justification for being less, than Jesus, I'd rather live by faith and trust one day I'll stand before him. And he says, well done, yeah. that good and faithful servant. Not, why'd you give me that woman? <laughs> so that's my order call. <laughs> so if your heart got touched, if you got convicted, if you got challenged, that's all good things. 
Follow your convictions. Don't violate your conscience. The goal of our instruction is love through a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a sincere faith. There's people out there that shipwreck their faith for the lack of a clear conscience. Yeah? Him to know to do right and doesn't, to him it is sin. Romans 14. Do you get it? Amen. So it's 806. Can we pray for the sick? I said we'd pray for the sick. So I'm just shifting gears, but I'm really not. It's all the kingdom. It's all the gospel. But you all good? Can I pray something over you all, please? Father, I just pray that you take every word tonight and let the conviction just stick in our heart in a beautiful way. I thank you. There's no condemnation. There's no wrong thinking tonight. I, I, I just pray, Holy Spirit, and ask that you would realign everybody's thinking. If, if this stuff tries to get used in the wrong way, well, there's no sense now. I sure blew it. I would just, God, you would blow that out of everybody's minds. And let us start here in this place like a racehorse in the starting block. Let us have a fresh start. Let's have a present and a things to come. God, we just start here. We repent here. And we say we're all in right here. So I'm asking you, Lord, to begin to teach us, bring these things to our remembrance, and even stir us with a hunger like we've never had. Now, would you respond with me in your heart, guys? And would you just take about a 30 seconds to a minute and just respond if you're serious back to God? You don't have to talk loud. You can whisper in your heart. You can just talk in your heart. But just say, you know what? I'm just yielding to you. I want to know you more. Holy Spirit, I welcome you and ask you to lead me. Just go ahead and respond to him right now in this place. This is your order, man. This is like your order call. This is your response to God. So you don't just say, hey, what did you think of the service? No, I was in the service and God was moving and he convicted me. So, Father, no matter what's going on around me, I want to walk in your love. I want to walk in your wisdom. I want to live what you paid for. I want every ounce of grace that you paid for to come on my life and empower me to be what you've always desired. Lord, I'm all in. And I thank you for this gospel. And most of all, I thank you for your unfailing love. Guys, that's how I talk to God. That's how I've talked to him my whole Christian life. Rarely do I ask a whole bunch of stuff that I need. I feel so fulfilled in this gospel. When you're surrendered, when you're not self-centered, you, you feel so fulfilled. There's a completeness in you. It's just amazing. So, Lord God, let our motives be pure. Let the fruit be pure. For the pure in heart shall see God. Would you multiply yourself through us by multiplying yourself to us? And would you let all men know who you are? Because we've seen you clear. Lord God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let no one be under some evangelistic pressure. Let us just be in the joy of spirit-filled living. And let us walk in the light as you're in the light. I pray through this message alone, just tonight in this room, that there be family restorations. I pray that marriages would just start in a good place as of tonight, that spouses would look at each other and just say, you know what, what have we been doing? It's just silly. Let's call it all dead and let's start right here. I just pray, Lord God, that no one would be weary and well-doing in this room. I pray, Lord God, that you restore relationships and families, Lord. I pray that you inspire everybody's heart. Young people, Lord God, that have felt beat down or insignificant or insecure, I thank you tonight's message alone is enough to change that and break that lie. God, I thank you. I'm just going to say yes to you. I believe I have value in you. I have value through you. And my life is on purpose, and my life is the will of God, and you gave your life so I could live mine in you. That's where I'm living. Teach me what that looks like, because I'm coming after you. That would be an amazing place, guys, to live. Yeah, in Jesus' name. Grandparents' wisdom tonight. Yeah, if you're, if you're a son or daughter here, and your parent, you're challenged by your parents, and, and some, one of your parents doesn't want nothing to do with the gospel or they seem like they're in the gospel, but they're just living way out of bounds in some ways. Don't be angry. Don't hate them. Don't get hurt by them. 
Just understand they don't know who they are and what they're doing or they wouldn't be living what they're living and stop taking it personal. Don't be deceived. Don't let it reflect on your value or a lack of love towards you. You are loved by God. Some people don't have the ability to love. They're bankrupt and we're expecting of them what they can't even give. Release all men tonight. Release everybody tonight, please. And only find your identity and stability in Christ. And then you can be a good friend, a good parent, a good son and daughter. You can be an amazing spouse. Let's be secure in Christ. Let's wake up every day and nobody owes me a thing. And I'm on the earth for one reason, to shine. And that's why I'm living. Man, that'll change everything. So, Father, I pray this grace in this house. I pray this grace in this region. And I pray that we're spirit-led, spirit-living people in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, are you, what's up? We're going to pray for the sick. Can we do it? Are you sure? It's 8-12. Are we good? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, we're going to pray for the sick, and I want to take a little time. It, it'll just take a little bit because I want to teach some things. I'm not going to teach a teaching or anything. Just as we're doing it, I'm just going to kind of teach. So the number one reason I've found in my own Christian life as I travel and meet and talk and counsel and, and connect with people is the number one reason people don't pray for the sick, they're afraid nothing will happen. It's not always their theological misunderstanding or what they believe or don't believe in scripture, they actually see the need and a lot of people have the heart to pray for the sick. But they don't step out and actually do it because they're afraid to be in an uncomfortable position because wonder if nothing happens, that's why they don't. But when you don't pray for the sick because you're afraid nothing will happen, you always have what you're afraid of. That's the dilemma. Because these signs follow those that believe, they what? They shall lay their hands on the... So a sign of a believer isn't so much are they going to be healed or not, it's that you actually get your hands on somebody. And the reason you put your hands on people because God's expecting you to believe that he lives in you and when you touch, he touches. I did public healing services for a long time years ago. I did two a week and opened them to the public, and it was, it was phenomenal. And, and it was just fun. I was a local pastor, and we just opened it up on Wednesdays morning and a Wednesday evening for public healing services. And people came by word of mouth. People got healed, brought all their friends. It was just phenomenal to watch how it unfolded. And I was in there doing uh, prayer. Now, in the beginning, I made the mistake. I was doing all the teaching and praying for all the sick. So then people marked me as a healing evangelist, a healing anointing, a healing gift, a healing ministry, a man of God that's flowing, you got to get to him. So everybody thought I had to pray for them to be healed when we're all believers and the believers lay hands on the sick and the sick recover. So the Lord talked to me about that mistake and I started to change some things. And But the one day I was there, I had all these people I was praying for and this little four-year-old girl came up with her mama and she said, my little girl drew you something and said she really has to give it to you. She's four. Guys, she's four. She has a folded paper and she had a crayon and she handed it to me she said here I said you have something to give me did you draw me a picture she said well I drew what I saw and that always gets you going she's four I said you drew what you saw yes I saw this I said you saw it I said let me see what you I opened it up guess what it was she traced her hand her little four-year-old hand she traced it and then she freehand drew a hand on the outside of it. And she said, this is what I saw. My heart's pumping. I'm like, what is that? What did you actually see? She said, every time you put your hand on a person to pray, there was this really big hand over yours. Four years old, innocent. She's watching. People getting touched and healed and things are happening. My hand's there, but guess why I'm laying my hand? because of the Christ that's in me and he's the hope of the glory of God. So a four-year-old said, every time you laid your hand, I saw this big hand right on top of yours. And I'm like, oh! So you just wanna lay your hands on a thousand people, right? So these signs follow those that believe they'll lay their hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. So the laying our hands on the sick is before they recover. So if you think too much about them recovering, you might pull back your hand and never even start the process of what faith is. Are you with me? So the first step of a believer, of a believer, 
is praying for the sick, laying hands on the sick. Now, here's why it's so dynamic. The number of people we have in this room, if we start to actively live believing that God's willing to heal through us, and we start loving on people, praying for people, see people, we see people all the time, guys. It's not just in a church service. It's not just being part of an altar ministry. It's not just being part of a ministry team. Every day you wake up and go outside, you're your sphere of influence. So you have a sphere of influence. If you multiply the sphere of influence by everybody that's in this room, it is a mega sea of people. And if we're all effectively just reaching out and being in faith, so you say, yeah, but wonder if they're not healed. But wonder if we fail to believe. Wonder if we don't even start a process. Here's the deal. I don't want to turn faith into a point in time. I I want people healed. I know there's suddenlies all through the Bible. Be honest with me, guys. Some of us struggle just to maintain a healthy attitude, and yet we're wondering why we aren't seeing all these dynamic miracles. Let's just, let's just start somewhere, right, and get our hands on the sick, believing. So if I touch somebody on the street, it's happened to me a whole bunch where I touch somebody on the street, boom, they're just healed, and they look at me like a deer in the headlight, and it's, they're like, oh my gosh, I've had people swear, what the blank, are you bleeping kidding me? And you're like, no, it's not a joke. It's real. He loves you. He's really amazing. I've had people say, I don't believe in God. It's okay. I do. Let me just pray. Come on. Don't say no. Please don't say no. And I ask people to not say no, and I just pray. But I've had people say they're somewhat healed. Hey, no kidding, man. I ain't joking. Oh, my gosh. That's a lot better. And they're like trying to convince me. And I'm like, no, that's the plan, but I want it all the way better. So let's thank God for what he's doing. Let's keep praying. I've never had in my whole Christian life, I've never had anybody tell me they were somewhat better and not let me pray again. Then I've had people that do what we're afraid of. They say, no, it still hurts. Does it hurt the same? Yeah, it's the same. Well, listen, I know you said you're on lunch and you were so kind to let me pray. I don't want to just keep praying and praying. I'm just going to believe what I prayed over you. Listen, God loves you. He said, if I lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. I'm excited. We started something today called faith in the kingdom of God's at hand. So here's the deal. When you're getting out of your car, you're going into work, you're going up your steps at home, you check on that thing. You stay mindful of this because I believe that's changing. And when it changes, you're going to know that it was him because he loves you. That way I'm not walking to my car defeated. Why didn't God move? Why doesn't he move through me? Where's the anointing in my life? What am I doing wrong? (laughs) What I'm doing wrong is I'm assessing my theology based on every circumstance instead of settling my theology through Jesus' life and attacking my circumstance with the truth. Are you with me? So I'm just going to pray for the sick. I'm going to pray for the sick. And here's how simple it is. I heard a preacher say this years ago, Randy Clark. I heard Randy Clark say this years ago. He said, listen, all I know is, guys, there's a lot of things we don't have answers for. There's a lot of things that have stumbled us. There's people we've prayed for and we've sure we believed and they went off and died and da, da, da. He said, but here's what I've learned and here's what I know. And I'm just going to help pass it on. I've never forgot it. He said, the more people we pray for, the more things we'll see. And that's one of those duh moments. Like, it's like, duh. Instead of overthinking, analyzing, and pulling back our hand to say we don't believe, you get your hand out there. So tonight we're going to pray for the sick. Fair enough? It's the will of God to pray for the sick. I teach on the forgiveness of sin a lot. I teach on righteousness. I didn't hit it hard this this time. Tonight we just, I don't even know what we did tonight, but I do know what we did tonight. (laughs) But we did it. (laughs) But a lot of times I preach on righteousness and the fact that he forgave us of sins. Why? If you look in the Bible, he's tied it together so much. He forgives all your sin. He heals all your disease. He bore your sin and my sin in his body on a tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness and by his stripes were healed. He says to the paralytic, son, take heart, your sins are forgiven. Hey, that sounds great to us because we understand, but back then they're like, okay, great. How about getting him up? They did not tear the roof off the building to hear your sins are forgiven. But Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. What'd they do as soon as he said it? He said, why do you always think evil in your minds? Why do you got to? What is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? But to show you the Son of Man has the power to forgive sin, go ahead, son, rise and walk. What did he do? He connected the forgiveness of sin to the rise and walk. 
It's God coming through Jesus, reconciling men back to himself, not imputing their trespasses, letting mercy triumph over judgment. What's he say in James? Pray for the sick, right? He says, if any of you are sick, let him ask the elders of the church, pray over them, anointing them with oil, praying the prayer of faith, and the prayer of faith will, not the anointing of oil, the prayer of faith will save the sick, and if they've committed any sin, that will be forgiven. In that scripture, it doesn't even say they repented. It doesn't even say they confessed their sin. It says the fact that they're healed shows that God has mercy over them and grace has come and mercy has triumphed and love has covered a multitude of sin. Like where sin has abounded, grace abounds greater. That's not saying sin is permissible, guys. What it's saying is God is greater. Yeah, that's designed to humble my heart and make me never want to live that way. Do you get it? So then he says, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you might be. So he's saying to be healed is to be forgiven. To be forgiven is to be healed. It's all through your Bible. You get it? So it's very important not to live condemned, not to live ashamed, and not to live guilty. It's very important to wear the robe of righteousness that he made for you and just go ahead and look good in it because it fits you well. Yeah? Yeah? 